Yeah, I'm Andrew. Um, I'm here to talk about rendering performance past the page load. Um, I, uh, perhaps a bit about me first, I'm, I'm a full stack developer. I've been in the industry since about 2010. Uh, during that time I've focused on building really fast, really performant apps. Um, and uh, hopefully today I can pass on a little bit of what I've learned. So, as developers, you'll often hear us talking about page load speed, and that's for good reason. Users have notoriously short attention spans. Oh, I knew I was going to do that. <laughs> um, but once we've engaged the user, what next? We need to keep them coming back, and to do that, we need to ensure their experience is seamless. And I believe that one way to do that is to ensure that it is a fast performing app. If you're doing your job right, there should be you know, no uh, jank or slowness as they're moving through the application. So today what I want to talk about is the rendering process. Um, you know, this is something that's been in browsers well, since the beginning, um, which is quite odd because usually when you go to these sorts of things you hear about the latest tech, but today I want to talk about, go right back to the beginning and talk about the rendering process. <coughs> so that process can really be broken down into, into four steps. You can get a bit more verbose with it, but today I want to break it down into four steps, talk about each one, and then talk about how you can optimize it. Those steps are pass, layout, paint, and composite. So, the first step, pass, is where the browser needs to take the response it gets from your server, so a HTML document, and it needs to kind of convert it into something that it can use. So, it will work through HTML and convert each element into um, a document node. And in the end, you're going you're gonna to end up with a document object model, the DOM. Not only that, but as it's going through that process, if it comes across a style sheet, it's then got to download that style sheet and pass that as well, and it's got to pass that into something called the CSS object model. So that gives it all the information that it needs. It gives, gives it a, a format that it can take on and begin to render. And it also gives it a format that, it can, that can be manipulated as the app is used. So, as I go through each of these steps, I want to sort of talk about how they can be optimized. Um, and for parsing, you know, you, you can improve on it by making sure that the browser has to spend at least time on it as possible. So when you hear people talking about critical path rendering, they're talking about reducing the time that it takes to get to the first paint of the browser. And um, it's during this stage that you can help with that by reducing the complexity of your styles, keeping the specificity as low as possible. You know, you could use a framework or like an architecture, sorry, like SMAX, which you know is is a, is a great architecture that keeps the specificity as low as possible and the complexity as low as possible. Once that once that step is complete, once it's finished passing you can begin to move on to layer. And this is, this is where things actually start to get really interesting because it's perhaps the most complex step. Was that gone? There we go. It's perhaps the most complex step for the browser to undertake. You often hear it called reflow. Um, because it has to figure out, now that it's got this document object model, where each element is placed on the page. Um, I think it would be much easier for me to, to show you the complexity of that for a video because it's, it's a little hard to explain. And this is something that's been around for, for a very long time. I know it was around at least four years ago, but um, let's have a look and see if it'll work. Let's see. So this is the browser laying out the page slowed down by a lot. <laughs> you wouldn't believe this is actually a very simple website. This is doing this figuring out where each element is laid out on the page. 
it's still going. <laughs> and once it gets to the end, you'll see actually how simple of a website that is. So this is just the old Mozilla website. And it has to go through all that process and figure out where each element is laid out on the page. So this is where we have the most opportunities to optimize. And this is where the browser spends the most time when rendering. Um, it not only happens, this is, I'm not sure I mentioned this process, not only happens when the page first loads, but it happens each time a change has happened that invalidates the layout of the page. So that could be as simple as changing the weight on a button. Because as far as the browser is concerned, that small change has invalidated the whole layout. The positions of elements could be in all different parts of the page. So, in terms of optimizing it, I think there's one hard and fast rule, it's to avoid manipulating the DOM as much as you can. So especially during you know, animations and that sort of thing. So, well, the thing here, and I'll mention this again as well, is we're dealing with user perceived performance. So, we often manipulate the DOM when we don't really have to. Um, and you know, if we can find ways to avoid that, that's, that's the best way to go about it. For example, batching your DOM manipulations. You know, this is, this is a, uh, a much more difficult thing to do back when jQuery was much more popular. But now we have things like Angular uh, MVC frameworks that you know, they're reflecting the state of your data through a, a template, which means that your template will you know, update as your data changes, rather than back in the day with jQuery, you'd update each part as you went along. I mean, there's ways you could go about it using the standalone template library, but um, with the frameworks, with the MC, MVC frameworks, it becomes a lot easier, especially if you're using immutable data, RX, that sort of thing. You can ensure that that template that is only updating, causing layout to happen as and when it's needed. I think if I have a look on here, there's a website which is quite useful. Let's see if I can just put it up. And this basically details which CSS properties will cause layout. So, uh, changing the font weight will cause layout, changing the height obviously will cause layout to recalculate, and you'd be surprised what properties will cause it. <coughs> It also goes through the next steps as well, and what causes those parts of the running process to happen. And that's uh, that's CSSTriggers.com. So, once the browser's figured out the layout of the page, it can then begin to paint it. And this is a step that I think is, is easier to talk about with the next step as well, with, with compositing, because it's, it's all about rendering the page onto the screen. Now, has anyone here used Photoshop or any image editing programs or anything like that? They all have the concept, this concept of layers. So you would have your base layer, you might have your background on it, um, and then you have layers on top of it which can be moved around independently of your base layer. The browser has a very similar concept and that's called composite layers. So, what happens is on your standard website you have one layer and what it's going to do is it's going to, it's going to paint on, on page load, it's going to paint the, the, the full website all at once. But if you introduce this concept of composite layers, you can separate things, some things out into their own layer. Um, and what, that, what you can do with that is if, if you're animating elements, so for example, a modal or a drop down or something like that. Being on its own layer means that the browser can, stick, that can skip um, past well, uh, layout and paint and go straight to composite because it's, it's moving layers about and it's changing the opacity of layers rather than just repainting the same flat image. 
So there's been some changes recently that can help with that will change. Um, CSS, CSS property will break out an element onto its own composite layer. Whereas previously, you would have to translate the element to move nowhere and it would, you could hack it essentially to, to break it out onto its own composite layer. But now this new property has come along that can do that for you. Now, this process is, is useful, but you know, the more layers you have, actually the worse it's going to be for your performance, because the more memory it's going to have to use up. So, uh, let's have a look and see if I can bring up some examples of how you can have a look at that. There's a website I've used a few times. So, I'll well, first show you how you can you can have a look at paint in a fairly simplistic way. Let's have a look at here. Um, rendering. So that's the three bands up here, and then you can go to more tools, and you can get a rendering panel. So if I hit paint flashing, that's going to begin to show me when elements on the page are repainted. So if I hover over here, it's showing me as different elements repaint. So if I turn that off, you can see there's a slight yellow hover behind that. But if I hover over this, it's showing me that those elements are repainting. repainting. If I click through, you can see it flashed up there because the page was, was painting for the first time. I click through. You can see it again to show when animations happen, it's painting that area. Okay. Another tool down here just below. You've also got an FPS meter in here which can be helpful, but it's it's a bit beyond the scope for this. You can select to see layers. So many websites don't use composite layers, but this particular one has. And I'm not sure if you can see from that far away, but there's a slight sort of orange line going around the header and underneath. And that's where it's showing a composite layer. Okay. Um, so we'll look at another example. This is actually something I haven't mentioned. Um, let's turn these animations on. <coughs> so, keep adding more elements to this page. You're going to see it get really, really slow. There we go. Look at that. Beautiful. Um, but if I hit this button here, quite a change. More I add, in fact, if I bring up that FPS meter again, you'll actually see, <coughs> see the difference. Getting around 59 FPS there, which is, is more or less perfect, that's what you should be aiming for. If I optimize it, A FPS. And the reason for that is, um, is to do with layout flashing, which is a bit harder to explain. Um, but it's where the browser is having to read and then write, read and then write. So it's having to recalculate recalcul calculate the layout every single time. And if um, you use the browser tools, the dev tools, you can figure out where those bottlenecks are and you can remove them. And I think that the, this is from a Google Doc page and actually goes through how you can take this page and, and, and get it to get to this end result. Um, so, I switch that off. Come back here. So, I think the important thing is to remember with this rendering process is to keep it in mind when you're developing. 
because you can then begin to make decisions based on um, what CSS properties to use, um, what elements that you should animate, and the, the general workings of your UI components, um, and make decisions or should I use this property because it requires layout? Can I do it? Do things slightly differently? Um, so yeah, I, I hope I've. It's quite a short one, so any questions, I'm happy to hear. Um, but yeah, I hope I've taught a little something. It's it's, it's a very old concept, um, but it's it's useful to, to have an update on on how that works. Um, if anyone has any questions. Or...